Okay, so I, I, I guess I can start at least according to my watch, which was manually shifted because of the time change. So I'm not sure whether we are in absolute uh, reference frame correctly, but anyway, I will start. So today we will talk about uh, spherical accretion as you, as you see. And I think I mentioned spherical accretion during the first or the second lecture. But I'm not sure if you are able to now answer immediately the question. If we have a black hole and a particle is flowing from infinity onto the black hole, how much energy it will emit? Any guess? I sort of implicitly said that, I think, on the first lecture. So particle is in free fall <clears throat> and falls into the black hole. Any idea? There is no viscosity and there is no... No, no, it's just one particle I mean, in the whole universe. There is a black hole. I mean, there is no process of emission. Then it will just directly go into the black hole. Exactly. There is, yeah, there is no spherical surface. Exactly, because it's a free fall. So the particle in a free fall will not emit any radiation and there will be no radiation. So calculating uh, efficiency, radiative efficiency of uh, such a flow is very difficult. And today we will not talk much about, or actually not at all about the efficiency, but at least you would imagine that dynamics of the flow is simple. Well, if you have a single particle and it's in a free fall, then yes, the dynamic dynamics is simple. But if you have a, a, a fluid, then everything becomes much, much more complicated. And to some extent, it might be even more complicated than Keplerian disks we will talk about later on. On the other hand, if we want later to understand what happens in the innermost part of the accretion disk. We would need this knowledge again. So the spherical accretion, it may seem kind of uh, artificial, but it's not that uh, uh, artificial uh, in some cases. And in many other cases, it's not obviously applicable, but it is applicable and it's important. So today, basically, we will start uh, from the problem which was posed already by, by Bondi, and he considered such a case. We have an interstellar medium going to infinity, whatever, does not matter, and then a star. And then this star will gravitationally attract this material, right? Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it's not that this material will flow immediately onto this uh, central body, because if the reservoir is infinite, then it will take infinite amount of time. Of course, the question is, does this process happen somehow rapidly, whatever, or it's actually a pretty slow process? And it's not so simple to, to answer to this question, but Bondi was able to, to answer to this question and we will follow his theory. But first, for, for that consideration, we will need to assume that uh, equations of hydrodynamics apply. Because this is what we will use. On the other hand, assumption of hydrodynamics is already a certain assumption. If you have one particle I was talking about uh, at, at the beginning, a minute ago, then you don't yet have the hydrodynamics, right? 
in order to have a fluid, you need really a continuous interaction of particles by scattering, we say, but basically it's a Coulomb interaction. So they have to exchange their momentum, energy, whatever, and then only they form a fluid. Otherwise, you have uh, a group of, of, of particles, and then you would have to worry about the velocity distribution uh, instead of just being able to use uh, uh, ideas like pressure, density, temperature. And this is where how we do the hydrodynamics. So the basic assumption uh, behind hydrodynamics is that the mean free path, lambda here, is uh, smaller than the characteristic distance of the system. For example, if we are at the radius r here, then if the mean three path is just much smaller than the radius, so the distance from the source does not change whatever, then we can use hydrodynamical uh, approximation. Uh, to derive the formula for the mean three path, this is not so simple because that, that really uh, uh, requires uh, statistics. Uh, but this is just a ready prescription, which I took, I think, from uh, uh, King book. He's not the first author, but I already always Frank, tend Frank, Frank, yeah, because Frank did not almost nothing to this book. So I, <laughs> <laughs> but alphabetically, he's the first one, but I always tend to forget what it was his name. That book is actually mostly written by King and Ray, um, mostly by, by King, actually. Anyway, so if you know the temperature, and the density number density of, of particles, then you can calculate this mean three path. And here, this lambda describes the, the, the Coulomb interaction. So, if we consider, for example, a, a kind of a spherical flow, and for the moment we will guess how it proceeds. So, we will say that, well, the radial velocity, just free fall velocity. Uh, here we have the mass and here is the current radius. So this is the velocity. And the accretion rate, we will assume spherical symmetry. It will be just four pi, so spherical symmetry, r squared, this is the surface, and then times density and velocity. And then we can introduce additionally the dimensionless quantities, which we introduced in the previous lecture, like Eddington accretion rate ratio and the distance in Eddington units. And we will assume that the temperature is also virial temperature. For the moment, those are just rough estimates. And then with this kind of uh, definitions, we can determine the ratio of this mean three path to the radius. And the result is 10 to 6 divided by some dimensionless quantities. It's huge, right? So we failed. There is no hydrodynamics. We cannot use this approximation, right? So then we can go home because <laughs> without hydrodynamics, we cannot do anything. Fortunately, there is something like magnetic field. And if you have even small amount of magnetic field, this theory does not apply. You can forget it because magnetic field is much, much stronger. And then the mean three path is actually determined not by this expression, which is here, but by Larmor radius. 
and that is usually, usually very slow. So later on, we will not talk about magnetic field, but we know that the interstellar medium is actually full of magnetic field. So we will assume that hydrodynamical approach applies. So this is already the first warning how important is magnetic field, even if it is not explicitly used. We will not talk about magnetic field during this lecture, but we are just happy with the statement that we can use hydrodynamical approach. And this is what we will do. So now hydrodynamical approach. In general, we should use Euler equations in 3D. This is just copied from some. Oops, sorry. From one one of the books. And what you have, you have continuity equation. In general, it's depend, it depends on, on, on time. And of course, this is a vector. This is a gradient. This is a vector. Then you have three equations of motion because we have three coordinates in general. And then we have also energy equation. The left hand side is conveniently written using entropy. But there are other formulations as well. And on the right hand side, here you also have important things. So, in the case of equation of motion, you have pressure gradient and you have external forces, for example, gravity. In the case of energy, you have radiation transfer term, you have con electron conduction term, and you have viscose stresses. So in general, this looks pretty complicated and you cannot do much. Uh, of course, you can use one of the of the numerical codes. But we will uh, not consider such a complicated issue. So then in addition, we still need some thermodynamical relations like equation of state or a prescription how entropy is connected to the uh, density and uh, temperature, how pressure is connected to the density and the projects expressions for those viscose stresses, thermal conduction, radiative flux, whatever. Uh, for the moment, we will concentrate on a perfect fluid. And in the case of perfect fluid, then it's more simple. And of course, we will consider the case which is stationary. That simplifies immediately a lot because then you have those partial derivative equal zero. This in the energy term, this in the continuity term, in force uh, terms as well. And we will concentrate for the moment on this energy equation, because this is also very complicated. There is something remaining from the previous version. I think this is the remnant of that one. Okay, sorry for that. Uh, and we would like to simplify the energy equation. So the simplest assumption is that uh, we have an adiabatic case. So we have no energy losses. Then we will not have to, to solve this stupid equation with a lot of, of terms. And then we can assume for the equation of, of state that we have a perfect fluid, monoatomic, non-relativistic gas. And in this case, energy is given by this expression, energy density and pressure. As I mentioned, it's given in this way. OK. 
So now the, the, the condition for the constant entropy translates because it has this form. This is also written sometimes in, in various forms. But this is the form which I, I, I like personally much. And this is just the law of thermodynamics that the change of the energy is equal to heat minus PDV. This is the work done by the system. And V here is just one over rho over density. This is the proper volume. So if you use this equation and you put this into zero and you work with those two things, then you will get such an equation. And this equation is easy to integrate. And what you will find is something like T to power three third, this comes from this actually, times density to the power minus one is constant. It is more frequently expressed rather in such way as relation between pressure and the density. So either as pressure equal a constant time density to plus five thirds or in this form. So if we have this form, then we can forget about the energy equation, which is nice. So in general, we can uh, consider several equally simple uh, cases. So this is this non-adiabatic, non-relative, uh, adiabatic non-relativistic case, as I told you. If you have a relativistic case, then uh, equation of state changes, and then you have such a relation. Again, for adiabatic case. So just to be uh, general, we can always introduce something with the index gamma, because then we can cover all cases, right? And the special case is isothermal case. We will not talk much about it, where just gamma is equal one, so the temperature is, is constant. OK, so we are now a bit better uh, prepared to, to solve this uh, problem, which Bondi started and actually solved it in 1952, so quite a long time ago. And we will use this polytropic case. So again, we have this infinite medium with uh, asymptotic value of the density and temperature. And inside, we have a star of a mass m and radius r. So uh, can this gamma be observed, uh, can calculated observationally? Uh, well, directly no, but you, if, if you know physics and you, if you know that uh, the medium is partially ionized, then from the level of partial ionization, you can actually calculate that. So you need from observation the information how, how ionized is the medium. And, but is it kind of degenerate? Yes. So if one has to know any of them to calculate. I mean, either you have to know the degree of ionization or this. Okay. Yes. Yes. Theoretically, you just assume certain value. Okay, so still it's not quite simple, but now we have to do it in spherical symmetry. So here I copied from the from the book a version which is already in spherical coordinates everything, like equations of motion, but still you have here uh, time elements, which here is written in such a way that you have a partial derivative over time plus velocity times gradients. So if we have a stationary case, this is neglected, this is zero, but you still have those terms. And this is a continuity equation. So, of course, if you have spherical symmetry, then you have no dependence of, of uh, pressure on uh, coordinates theta or phi. So you can forget about those two equations immediately. 
And you don't have uh, velocity components theta and phi because of the symmetry. So now th this can be really simplified. Oops. Okay. And finally, from the continuity equation, you have only one term, one over r square, and then derivative of r square rho times velocity. And here I drop uh, index r because we have only one velocity. It's the radial velocity. And this equation is easy to, to integrate. You can multiply by r, r square just to get rid of this stupid thing. And then if this is constant, it means that well, this inside is constant. And of course, customarily we introduce the accretion rate. So for that purpose, we multiply this by four pi, and then we use minus V because V is negative when you have an accretion. On the other hand, accretion rate is kind of positive. <clears throat> Sometimes in some papers, they have negative accretion rate. So you have to be careful, but in most cases, yes, accretion is positive, velocity is negative. <laughs> You know, astronomy likes to have this kind of disorder. And the equation of motion from the previous slide also simplifies. So we have here the ra radial pressure gradient. We have the gravitational force, external gravitational force. And we have this sort of dragging term for velocity. So now we have to, uh, we have this equation, we have to solve this equation, and then of course we can use this polytropic equation whenever we need to combine the density and uh, pressure. So we can uh, integrate this equation as well, and we will do that later. But at the beginning, it's better not to integrate this equation in order to see well the problems Bondi faced in getting his equation, his solution. Okay, so now, now it's convenient additionally to introduce the sound speed. Sound speed by definition is the derivative of the pressure of, uh, with respect to the density. And in the case of polytropic case, this is really simple. You have no doubts how to calculate that. And then you can express the pressure gradient and through the density gradient. And then this factor will come in front. So then you will see the equation in this form. But still, you have here dv over dr and d rho over dr. So here you can uh, change dv, v dv over dr into derivative of dv square over dr, then the equation looks better. And then you can go back to this equation here and you have another relation still before integrating another relation between d rho over dr and dv over dr. You have to combine those two equations. This is simple action, but this is what you will get because the equations are, equations are quite complicated. So your final equation where you got rid of this factor using continuity equation looks like this, dv square over dr is equal something here and something here. The something here is one minus sound speed square divided by velocity square. So at in infinity, uh, velocity is uh, very small. So this factor is uh, very large. This factor is small. So that goes here. This factor is more or less uh, small. But when the velocity of the matter rises, 
at some point it will look like free fall in most cases, unless the star is huge and then you never reach free fall velocity, but that, that rarely happens. If you reach some speed, and free fall velocity is always larger than some speed, then you see you have a catastrophe. You have here zero. You have to divide by zero uh, and so on. So this is so-called critical point of the solution, right? It's not very intelligent name, you see you have a problem. So usually two situations can happen because the numerator also may vanish at some point. So it may vanish before we reach the sound speed and then the velocity will become zero and the flow will stop, right? But, but for, for that, the star would have to be enormous, really. On the other hand, most frequently, this will become zero first, and then the change of the velocity is infinite and further integration does not have any, any meaning. So we are stuck. But of course, there is always a chance to balance those two things. So we, we say that, well, the lucky thing is when you have zero here at the same time as zero here. So then you have zero over zero. It's not easy, but then it looks like doable because zero over zero may give you something finite. And then you will be able to, to cross the sound speed and still increase v square. But it's difficult. It is difficult. So then such a transition would happen when the velocity is equal to sound speed. And at the same time, this has to be also zero, and this gives you the, son the sonic point or the Bondi radius. Traditionally, it is notified as RS because this is the sonic point, right? So you have this, the, the Bondi radius here. And then your flow consists of two parts, slow, outer, subsonic flow when the velocity uh, is much smaller than sound speed and then at bondy radius you go through sonic velocity through some sonic point and then you continue with the innermost supersonic inflow yes but these two parts of the flow are like touching each other? Like yes, yes, because at this point, <coughs> because of this zero over zero, mm -hmm. you have to cross quite carefully and you will be just continuous. Both ve velocity will be continuous, density will be continuous, and it will but numerically, it's not so easy to. Okay. But before we go to the um, flow topology, which I will show you in a moment, we will estimate where is this boundary radius because it's important to know whether this thing is of interest or it's not, right? So we didn't solve the whole problem yet, but we can say that, well, okay, let's say sound speed does not change that much in the flow. So we can calculate the sound speed using the external conditions, the temperature, asymptotic value of the temperature. 
So then you put this value here. And then you can also put this, uh, yes. Yeah. So then you can calculate the boundary radius using this temperature. And then you can calculate the ratio of this to the uh, Schwarzschild radius to estimate uh, things more easily. And in this case, you have a ratio of the C square, which is the uh, light speed, to the sound speed. And of course, sound speed is much lower than this, the, the light speed. And many orders of magnitude, four, five orders of magnitude. So then you see that this Bondi radius is much, much, much larger, several orders of magnitude larger than the Schwarzschild radius. So if you have a black hole, certainly this kind of uh, transonic accretion will take place. And if we have the, this Bondi radius, we can also estimate, it's still estimate, it's not yet calculating, the accretion rate. Oops. Yeah. Because we have this continuity equation, right? So we have we need the density and the velocity, but you, we can use the density from the uh, asymptotic infinite position. Velocity is the sound speed and the radius, we have the radius, right? So we can estimate the, the Bondi accretion rate. And this is how very frequently Bondi accretion rate is estimated in all elliptical galaxies. Just that, nothing more advanced. So you see, it's, it's simple. Actually, if you try to understand this uh, concept of, of Bondi radius, even more simply, not going through the hydrodynamical considerations, you can do it approximately. So it's even easier than what, what we did. Because we can consider, for example, the, the uh, kinetic uh, energy or thermal energy of the particle in the interstellar medium. And this is more or less KT. And then the potential energy of the same particle, if the particle has, it is a, pr a proton, for example, it's this. So if the thermal energy is larger than the potential energy, then the particle does not agree. If it's smaller, if the gravity wins, it will agree. So if you put this into that, you can calculate something like this. It's more or less the same, but with accuracy of factor two or something like that. So this is, sort of intuitively, uh, intuitive explanation for the, for the Bondi formula. On the other hand, this exercise, which we did using hydrodynamics, really shows you the important thing, this change of the character of the flow from subsonic to supersonic flow. On the other hand, we, we were a bit lazy and we finally didn't use this value of gamma you asked about. If we use this value of gamma, as I told you, you, you can integrate this equation. But then this gamma, of course, remains. So the differential equation now changes into, changes into Bernoulli equation. This is a certain constant. This gamma is present everywhere. And the constant value can be uh, estimated asymptotically because asymptotically, this is zero, this is zero, and you have only the, uh, the temperature or the sound speed asymptotically. So you have the Bernoulli constant in this way, and then you can calculate the Bondi radius and you can calculate the Bondi accretion rate much more carefully. And this is where you see the problem. 
It was for the perfect fluid, monoatomic uh, gas. This gamma, I told you, is equal exactly five thirds. So if you put here gamma equal five thirds, you will get zero here. So this is why people usually use this previous expression because they don't have to, to, to worry about uh, exact value. On the other hand, the Bondi radius, the position of the Bondi radius can be really estimated completely incorrect. Right? Because if you, if you mistake zero for uh, 10 to 5, for example, that's a really big error even in astronomical you know, approach where factor 2 is fine. Order of magnitude is still not that bad. That five orders of magnitude, that's going a bit too, too, too far. So here formally we have a condition that gamma should be smaller than 5 thirds. On the other hand, for the Bondi accretion rate, that's more tricky because here you have zero, but you also have zero here. So you have to do very tricky limit, and this value is finite, even for gamma equal five thirds. Fortunately, if we deal really with partially ionized medium, then most of the people assume that this gamma is equal 1.4 in the interstellar medium. I wouldn't put much money into that, but okay, well, roughly, right? So if, if we use this, then uh, we are quite happy with both the Bondi radius and the accretion rate, and accretion rate anyway does not diverge. So we can then express the accretion rate again using dimensionless units. And then we get the uh, value 10 to minus 6 times the mass of the object divided by the solar mass. So if we consider, for example, a black hole of the mass equal uh, solar mass, then this dimensionless accretion rate from interstellar medium is 10 to minus 6. Forget it, not very interesting. On the other hand, if the black hole mass is, for example, uh, 10 to 6 or 10 to 9, it can be important. And this is why this Bondi accretion is uh, uh, considered in the case of Sagittarius A star or elliptical galaxies, and it's, it's really a reasonable source of accreting material. But now let's, let's look at the, at the solution, because you asked whether we are really passing, whether this, this solution is continuous or is not continuous. This here shows you the radial distance here in uh, solar, uh, in, in Bondi, in Bondi uh, units. So here you have Bondi radius, and here you have the ratio of the velocity to the sound speed. So we start normally with low velocity. We go through this sonic point smoothly, and we approach the black hole. Of course, to study the black hole, we need uh, GR, so we are not yet going to, to, to the black hole itself, but it's really highly supersonic flow, no problem. But if, we, if you look at those equations, they um, actually have two signs, because the basic equation is for V square, but you, have, you can have two signs. So you have also another solution. You start with small and zero velocity, and then your outflow is subsonic, and then your outflow becomes supersonic, and you flow away. It's exactly the same solution. It's just changing the sign of V. So this red thing is a Bondi solution, but this green thing is Parker's solution, 
1958 for solar wind. So this is how solar wind looks like. And they actually cross here, right? So those formal solutions. So if you try to uh, follow the solution which is not properly matched to this point, then of course you will fail, right? Because if you start, for example, the flow, something like that, then your numerator will uh, become, well, your, your, uh, your flow starts to be supersonic before the numerator is zero. So then you have uh, infinite derivative. The formal integration will give something like that. But then you cannot have a flow which is flowing, flowing and outflowing at the same time. So if you try, then it would not be a stationary. It would be highly variable thing if you impose such uh, boundary condition. For example, here, you never cross the, the sonic point, but you can assume that if, for example, the star is huge and you settle the material there, maybe you don't need this, but anyway, the topology of solutions is quite complicated. But it can be even more complicated. <laughs> Because I told you that those equations for the spherical case, they are corresponding to this solution, those two solutions. There is nothing else. On the other hand, very similar equations with minor modification apply, for example, in the case of the stream, which is flowing through the inner Lagrange point towards the, the, the other uh, star. If you have a low angular momentum, but not zero angular momentum, you have very similar equations. If you have uh, ADA flow, you have very similar equations. You have additional terms. If you have uh, heating or cooling, if you have viscosity, you have similar equations, or actually you have one equation which has this form that the derivative of the velocity with respect to the radius is equal numerator over denominator plus several regular equations, which you have also to integrate, but they are not troublemakers. But if you have those additional uh, equations, you can have other topologies of this difficult point. So here I schematically drawn this Right? And this is called saddle point. In the case of innermost uh, abrasion flow from the uh, Keplerian disk to the black hole, this kind of uh, transition works if the velocity, if, if the viscosity is low. If the viscosity is high, then you have nodal point. Then you see it's more difficult actually to cross because it's not quite uniquely defined. And there are also other points, but if you have such a topology, you cannot cross anything. You don't have the, the, the transonic solution like this, right? You cannot have a flow line. So then you need uh, shocks. I think one of you, I don't remember, who, was, was sort of doing such solutions for master thesis, right? Yes, that was you. So you have an expert there. Okay, so maybe we'll shortly return to those uh, things, but in any case, uh, sometimes we need shocks. Because if, if we have a black hole, then okay, you don't need a shock because you can go with arbitrary velocity, you go with uh, light speed through the horizon and that's it. But if, for example, you have a, an accretion onto a star which has a surface like white dwarf, neutron star, whatever, then finally you have to settle the matter on the star, right? 
So if it, with this previous topology, it, your material would never end up on the stellar surface. On the other hand, here, the matter passes through the sonic point and it's just supersonic and it does not care yet about the, the, the existence of the star. So what happens? At some point, you need a shock and the shock gives you a possibility to jump from that supersonic branch to subsonic branch and then settle quietly on the star. But you need a shock. Otherwise, you cannot really uh, proceed with accretion onto a star with the surface. So then you have really a sequence of uh, events like first subsonic accretion, then sonic points, supersonic accretion, shock, subsonic accretion, and finally at the surface material is more or less at rest. So then we have to consider those conditions which have to be satisfied to pass the shock because it's not that you can just do the shock and then before the shock and after the shock you have arbitrary different uh, conditions because there are some conservation laws and those conservation laws have to be preserved. First of all, conservation of mass basically conservation of momentum, and then conservation of energy. Of course, we can assume uh, adiabatic shock, so then we don't have losses. Generally, you can have mass loss or angular momentum, or uh, uh, momentum loss or whatever. But in ideal case, you have those three conservation laws, and you have to, to consider how those equations behave when you cross the shock. You can do it in that case in plane parallel approximation, of course. So then whether it's radial or, or uh, plane parallel, it does not uh, matter. So we have a continuity equation. We can drop in that case R square because we know that uh, this is small region, so R will not change. So let's forget about it. And here we have some gravitational force and here we have those things. And then we expect that the velocity will change dramatically across the shock as well as pressure and uh, density. So we, what, what we do is we multiply this equation which was before by the density. And then we have to integrate it over the radius, over this narrow range covered with the shock. So we assume that the shock can be resolved <coughs> and we integrate and we know that this is constant. So integrated dv over dr over dr just gives delta dv. Integrating this gives just delta p, right? And integrating this should give something, but then the upper and lower limits are similar. So if we go with this width of the zone with zero, then this term will disappear. So then, then we will get the following conditions. <coughs> and then we do similar thing to the energy equation and we have another condition. So those are famous rankine hugonio conditions for the change of parameters across the shock. So it's a textbook, of course, knowledge. So you have uh, conditions before the shock and after the shock. And now you can uh, assume that before the shock, uh, Mm, uh, pressure is, is uh, small because you have highly supersonic flow, so pressure is unimportant. And then those conditions partially simplify because you can neglect pressure before the shock. And then you write separately the continuity equation, this Bernoulli equation and energy equation on the left and on the right. 
And then you have to work with this. There is some kind of algebra. But if you introduce the ratio of the velocity z1 to v2, then you finally arrive to an equation like this, which has two solutions. One x is not very interesting because nothing happened, right? There is no shock. The medium is continued. On the other hand, the other solution gives you x equal four. That means that the jump in the velocity and jump also in the density is by a factor of four in the case of strong shock. In all other shocks, it's smaller than four. So this jump is not by orders of magnitude, as you might say, but still factor four is enough to jump from supersonic to considerably subsonic. So we will now talk a little about applications. But of course, applications are always much more complicated than the simple theory. But still, I would like to show you that, well, this theory, but a bit enriched, can be used in real cases. It's not just an abstract uh, consideration. So, for example, first we will uh, consider the accretion column onto white dwarf or neutron star. So we will assume that the uh, white dwarf or neutron star have a very strong magnetic field. If the star has very strong magnetic field, then the matter cannot do whatever the matter wishes, but the matter has to go along the field lines. And of course we know that uh, from, uh, from the Earth because uh, uh, we don't see this uh, uh, what's Aurora Borealis. Aurora Borealis. Okay, I took it from Polish Wikipedia so this is why I typed Polish name that was not just a mistake. So you know that particles from the Sun they are falling along the poles and not in the equator, right? because of the magnetic field, which allows to fall along the poles. Of course, this fall is not uh, really dense matter, and uh, so this is not for our hydrodynamical approximation that here you would need to do something different than, than that. But uh, actually the accretion uh, flow onto the white dwarf, for example, will look similar. So we have a donor star. This is, let's say, uh, an example of uh, AM Hercules system. So we have a donor star and a white dwarf with strong magnetic field. So there is a stream of material through this inner, inner Lagrange point, and then it goes towards the pole of the star. It does not form the disk. There are also intermediate polars. In that case, you have an outer accretion disk and then it is disrupted and then still the stream falls along the poles. So finally, the accretion happens only here, in that part. Is accretion is wind or low slope? This is low slope. Huh. This is L1. So this is normally Roche Roche slope overflow, and here it's this normal stream as we talked. But then this stream does not fall, does not create circularization radius and accretion disk because it, the flow is, is governed now by the magnetic field. So the equations which we are using on the previous lecture, they do not apply in that case because the magnetic field is stronger. We simply previously said that there is no magnetic field. I didn't say that explicitly, but uh, implicitly this is what was assumed. And here the, the, the matter, so uh, here no, normally with, if you have no magnetic field, you would have an accretion disk here. 
and then you would have a cataclysmic normal CV like dwarf nova, for example. But this is polar system, which means high <laughs> magnetic field this, system. Uh, this geometry is like the magnetic field pushes the matter forming the accretion disk. Yes, yes, really yes, up. yes. In, in, in normal polars, where the magnetic field is strong, larger than 10 to 7, you don't even try to, to form the magnetic field. If you have an intermediate polar, you form an accretion disk, so you have the circularization radius, but then in, inside the disk is disrupted when the pressure in the disk becomes uh, smaller than the magnetic pressure density. And then you switch into this kind of yeah. flow again. So the, the disk never then touches the, the yeah. white dwarf. So then if you draw this part just enlarged, okay. Then in some approximation, well, in reasonable approximation, the situation looks like this. This is now the surface of the white dwarf, right? It is just this part which is enlarged. And here you have an accretion column. Of course, this is not spherically symmetric case. So what? This looks like a partially part of the spherically symmetric solution, right? You can imagine it's just a small fragment of spherically symmetric flow. And this flow is certainly supersonic here because this was the stream which is highly supersonic. So now this flow here tries to reach the, the, the pole of the, of the wide dwarf. So first it's supersonic and then it most frequently develops a shock and then slowly settles onto the surface of the white dwarf. So it looks like perfect application of our simple theory. Of course, it's not uh, as simple as that, because now there is a question, where is this shock position? I didn't derive any constraints previously on the shock position. Because actually in real situations, the shock position will depend on the cooling of the matter before the shock, after the shock. And that's difficult, right? I told you that in, in the case of spherical accretion, cooling is difficult. And then, of course, here we have strong magnetic field, so cooling in the strong magnetic field um, has to be considered. So, of course, we can easily guess that we see a lot of uh, emission, uh, hard X-rays, this will be mostly Bremsstrahlung strahlung emission, will come from this column. Then uh, there will be a lot of energy also dissipated here and the thermalized and you will see the, the thermal emission from the surface of the, of the white uh, uh, dwarf. So you will see two components of this, of this emission. The system, in addition, when it moves on the orbit, it shows frequently either eclipses or at least variability with the, the period of the system. So from that, you can try to, to guess the exact geometry, how this happens. But apparently it's not so simple. So when, when I looked into this, issue for some reason many many years ago there was a problem whether we actually have this shock high above the the surface or we don't and i checked recently and people still have the same problem so here you see two geometries so this is so-called fan beam model where you have the, what I described below supersonic flow then shock and then slower settlement of the 
of the matter. This is for the neutron star case, but for the white dwarf also it's still under discussion. But here they say that actually the, the flow is uh, supersonic all the way down and then the shock is actually very close to the, to the surface. And then there is a lot of radiation and this radiation somewhat decelerate the matter. So then the shock is not as strong as you might expect in this case. And people still discuss that. So this is this this is the picture from '96. I think somebody PhD thesis. But uh, in in recent papers, the the problem still exists, and probably the solution depends on the exact strength of the of the magnetic field. and also on the description of the cooling. So for example, I, I looked at most recent paper I found, because the issue is not highly discussed now, because, you know, if they couldn't solve it for many years, <laughs> then they cannot solve it now. But I okay, think that's an example of the, of the paper uh, intermediate polar, so that is again uh, white dwarf, our Scorpi from Takata two years ago. So what what they see from the from the uh, motion of the of the binary system, they see that the emission is kind of periodic, right? So this. So the part which we see the emission is pretty wide. But still, they, they, they cannot claim firmly that they have fun model. They would rather think a mixture of fun model and this pencil model. So it's difficult. And everything is, is because of, of uh, well, from observations, you cannot see a lot. You have just this picture. And then you have to guess all those cooling, all, all, all those processes, which is difficult. Title, the subtitle disappeared from this transparency. Sorry, it was probably late yesterday in the evening and uh, uh, it got lost. So now I will uh, try to talk about the second uh, uh, example, namely Sagittarius A star. It's a massive black hole, right? Four times 10 to six. So according to what I said, uh, half an hour ago, you expect quite a lot of mass, hot material, operating from interstellar medium. So in that case, you should have plenty of this material operating, and we should be happy. Well, we can estimate uh, uh, bond radius and the accretion flow because we can measure the temperature the temperature from from chandra max they they measure the, the the center quite quite well and the temperature is more or less 1.3 kv which is uh, uh, 10 to 7 kelvins if you prefer this is in soft x-rays and then from emissivity profile, they were able, it's the oldish paper, Baganov et al. 2001, but uh, new papers give more or less the same thing. Agatha was doing similar analysis as well. They have something like 20 particles per cubic centimeter. It's slight, not seem much, but nevertheless, the bond radius calculated, assuming uh, previous uh, uh, formula, give 0.1 parsec, 
and we can calculate the accretion rate, bond the accretion rate, 10 to 21 grams per second. And now the problem starts, actually, because if we assume efficiency 10%, then we can calculate the, the luminosity, right? We take 10% efficiency, 0.1, we multiply by C square and we have the luminosity, the volumetric luminosity. What we get from such an approach is 10 to 42 X per second. We don't have such an emission from Sagittarius A star. No way, nothing, nothing like that. What we observe is a stationary emission, nine orders of magnitude below that, and well, during the flares, it's just two orders of magnitude higher, but nothing even comparable to 10 to 42. Okay, you can say that, well, efficiency, I, I overdid with efficiency. But it's difficult to go with efficiency very, very low, as Russians argued many years ago, and Russians are always very good in physics, you cannot heat protons without heating electrons. So assuming much, much lower efficiency is not realistic. On the top of that, now I don't have a reference, but uh, um, several years ago already, uh, Sagittarius A star was observed in radio at many frequencies and the Faraday rotation was estimated and from the Faraday rotation you have the integrated amount of material along the line of sun. And that material implies that we have the accretion flow less than 10 to 18 grams per second. So we are three orders of magnitude wrong with this bondy flow. So somehow we have too much of this material. How to get rid of this material because this stupid material wants to flow in. And that was elegantly solved uh, in, in the paper published in 2004 by Quartered. He did a very simple work used equations that those are equations from his paper they almost look like what i showed you before nothing very very fancy simple analytical model the difference is actually main difference is in the right hand side later he also drops those uh, terms so he assumes uh, stationary model oops sorry not this one. But the right hand side is here in both. He assumes that we have to concentrate really on, on the realistic sources of the material. And this realistic source of the material are mostly stellar winds. Paradoxically, it might not solve the problem because those stellar winds actually provide even more mass than the interstellar medium. But still, it solved the problem. Oops. Ah. No. Yes. Okay, so this is the slide I wanted. Something is wrong in the order of those slides or I'm doing something like that. Okay, so I repeat the same equations uh, here. What he did was to estimate roughly the number of stars and there are only few stars which really lose a lot of uh, wind. This plot comes not from Quarter because he just estimated something roughly. A year later, 
Quadra et all they did uh, much more careful analysis. This is really the, the, the representation of the of the uh, central part of Sagittarius A star and those red stars mark sources of strong stellar winds. So he took a lot of this material and put to the right hand side of the solution. And that changed the solution. So what he got is the following picture. So he now, he's using the negative value for the inflow. So then you have to flip in your mind this kind of plot. Because so what he has is this kind of velocity profile. But what is really important it, he even did not mark the sonic point, which would be somewhere here. That was not important for him because he, he knew how to pass through the sonic point and he did. On the other hand, he has here something like velocity equals zero. Stagnation point. And this is absolutely new. He produced so much mass that this mass contains also energy because those winds are, are uh, high velocity winds. They have velocities of order of 1,000, 2,000 kilometers per second. So they are not really bound by the, by the central black hole. They are not uh, uh, staying there. They are dynamically escaping. So actually most of the material escapes the region. So more or less our estimated bondi radius is here and he's in his case he already sees there supersonic outflow of all those material so this is why only a small fraction of the material reaches actually sagittarius a star everything else is expelled and the stagnation point makes a difference. So this is outflow, this is inflow. It has some continuous solution for three cases of parameters, whatever, it does not matter. It's always more or less the same. And it's quite a general statement. It's not So in the case of uh, M87, which is now very famous, we can repeat the same exercise with Bondi radius. We can calculate the Bondi radius. I don't remember the Bondi radius. I didn't put it here. But we have from X-ray maps, we have uh, determination of the density and the temperature. And then we can calculate the accretion rate, from the accretion rate, which is four orders of magnitude higher than in the case of Sagittarius A star. So the luminosity should be 10 to 45 or something like that, or even more. But the observed luminosity is 10 to 40. So it's the same problem. We have a lot of material, but it does not reach, most of this material does not actually reach the central part. So application of the Bondi flow to the two elliptical galaxies will give you the wrong prediction unless you make a correction for as, as quarter did, for the stagnation point for the outflow.
And this is very, very important. On the other hand, theory, uh, I mean, everything else applies, but you have to, to take into, into account much more carefully the sources of material. Otherwise, all your predictions are absolutely wrong. Well, in the case of M87, we actually sort of know what is happening because now we have this image from the Event Horizon Telescope. And we will talk about it later on. But for the moment, what I can tell you is, well, here we see a shadow or a silhouette of a black hole, right? It's really impressive. And then we have something bright, which is shining. And then it's a good question what it is. Either it's an accretion flow or a jet in projection. You can choose at this moment. In the discovery publication, they advertise that this is the accretion flow, the innermost part of the accretion flow. We have a top view of the source. That's true because the jet is more or less towards us. So we have a top view of the source. So either you see the accretion flow, you have a black hole, right? And you have an accretion flow, or you have a jet in projection. They look identical. So we will talk later when we are better equipped with knowledge about non-thermal emissions and hydronic radiation at this kind of thing because the, the image is actually done in uh, synchrotron radiation, right? In millimeter band by ALMA and other telescopes. So this is more or less what I wanted to, to tell you today. There is no homework today. Next time there will be something again. So questions? So in terms of the span beam and the pencil beam, is it the only position of the shock is the difference or are there other things about the uh, beam line structure that would change the, uh, the beam? It's hard to say. Actually, there is still a discussion whether, particularly in the case of, of the neutron stars, whether this, this column is actually uh, filled with this matter or it it's is hollow. kind of empty hollow thing, yeah. or it has many streams, individual streams of material. Because I, I remember that I saw once a paper that if you compare the soft emission from, the, from this polar cuff, mm -hmm. then you it, it can calculate the surface of an emitting surface. But then from eclipses, you also have the size of the emitting surface from the geometry. And those two, they are not consistent. So the, the emitting, actively emitting surface is smaller. So it implies that the whole cup is not fully filled with things which emit in, in soft x-rays. But that does not identi identify immediately exact uh, geometry, whether it's a kind of hollow cone or some spaghetti style thing or anything else. I think uh, Vasco and Sunai, 19, some 1970, I don't remember the date, mm -hmm. but they are good. Like the, the geometry should be hollow because you shouldn't expect the accretion from the middle of the field lines. You should expect like the field line that are, that are surrounded to mm -hmm. the polar cap. So the matter will go through the like all over the field line, but mm -hmm. except the center part. So it should be something like hollow geometry. Yeah, somehow from, from observations, I, I, I think it's not so simple to, to, to get it. I don't know why, because for example, for, for, for pulsars, you, you have quite a lot of constraints on, 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 on geometry. But apparently here, maybe it's not very, for example, because probably if you have hollow cone that was really narrowing, then probably due to this wobbling and due to this 
uh, motion in, in binary system in principle, you should be able to, 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 to get more constraints. But uh, I was not doing that, so I don't know why it's still difficult. Uh, apparently, it still is. Other questions? Okay, if, if, if not, that's the, that's the end of the lecture and that's I told you more.